Founded in 1981, the Gay Men's Health Crisis, or GMHC, has been on the front lines of helping their clients find resources and services in the wake of the AIDS epidemic. The organization has successfully advanced the prevention and treatment of HIV and AIDS. Decades later, challenges still abound. Here to bring us forward to 2017 and help answer questions on the broader theme of things is the Chief Executive Officer of GMHC, Kelsey Louie. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. So, like I hinted at it just a second ago, but more than four decades ago, this organization sprang from a very real need and dearth of services in the community. Mm -hmm. Where are we now? So, well, in 1981, Gay Men's Health Crisis was formed by a group of gay men who are watching their friends die, literally, left and right. They're watching their friends, their lovers, their relatives die one at a time. Um, fast forward to 2017, um, an HIV diagnosis is no longer a death sentence, um, and uh, we continue the, um, the spirit of serving our community and taking care of our community. Today, GMHC serves more than 12,000 people a year through a number of services, including hot meals, nutrition counseling, legal services, mental health counseling, substance use counseling, HIV prevention and testing, um, comprehensive sexually transmitted infection testing, including hep C, and our newest program, housing. For the first time ever, we're providing housing for people who are homeless and HIV positive. So housing is a large component, and we've heard advocates talk about if you can house people, you can save so much more resources down the line yeah. because it prevents them from all sorts of other bad outcomes. Yeah. Well, the way we say it is we say that housing is a driver of the epidemic, or mm -hmm. un homelessness is a driver of the epidemic. I mean, if you just think about it rationally, how could someone take their medication, keep their appointments steady, if they don't have a place to live, right. if they don't have a place to put their medication? Mm -hmm. So we at GMHC, we understood that need. We also heard directly from the clients. One mm -hmm. of the things that I love to do is to speak directly to the clients and to listen to the clients. And housing was the number one unmet need of our clients. Mm -hmm. So GMHC partnered with the city to um, to have um, today 25 units of supportive housing, and we're hoping to expand that. I know that there's been some talk coming out of the governor's office about him pushing forward initiatives that also provide housing for uh, people in the community with HIV. Yeah, so there are many initiatives coming up. New York, New York 4 is what it's called, to create, I think, upwards of 15,000 new supportive housing units over the next five years. Mm -hmm. um, the governor, um, Governor Cuomo, has been a great partner for not just the HIV community, but also the LGBT community. Um, one of the things that is remarkable is that the governor um, has um, supported a plan to end the AIDS epidemic in New York State by 2020. Right, um, a very aggressive plan. Yes, I was fortunate to be one of the 62 or so AIDS experts and activists who were part of that task force. And um, it was based on three pillars. Um, one, um, identify people who are HIV positive, link them and connect them to care, um, and then get them, uh, and to get them virally suppressed. And three, to um, adopt a widespread use of new prevention tools like PrEP and PEP. So looking at the mission of the GMHC and how it's evolved over these interceding decades into housing, there's also something that the founders may not have anticipated. These long-term survivors yes. is the term, which is a happy problem to have, but still people who have to be provided for in the community. So I wondered if you could speak to them specifically and about how the GMHC continues to evolve. Yeah, well, June 5th was um, National HIV AIDS Long-Term Survivors Awareness Day. Right. Um, so a long-term survivor of HIV and AIDS is basically, um, sometimes it's defined as someone who um, was diagnosed prior to the advent of um, antiretroviral medications in the mid-90s, but basically anybody who can self-define as a long-term survivor, sure. 10 plus years or so. And what's happening is because of the advancements in medication, people have been living longer. Mm -hmm. Like you said, it's a great problem to have. Yeah. And so, but with that comes um, unexpected complications. Um, some. Um, health-related complications, isolation, mental health issues, loneliness. Um, and so, and a lot of times people um, 
who thought they were going to die um, stopped working or couldn't work, yeah. and now they're healthy, yeah. and there's a big gap in their... They've outlived their death sentence, yeah. so to speak. Yeah, and so, so these group of people have a unique set of needs. But not only that, these are our heroes, Absolutely. our war veterans that we need to honor and take care of. So in the same lens, there's also a mental health component. When you survive the plague and you're still here and you're revered now and have something to share with generations that have followed, but there's also a very real isolation and just figuring out what to do when you're essentially on borrowed time, but you're thriving. Yeah, so I mean, mental health is also another driver of the epidemic. Um, Untreated mental health issues for long-term survivors can mean isolation, not going to their medical appointments, not taking their medication. I mean, it can undermine um, a medication regimen. It could also, it could also undermine prevention efforts. Mm -hmm. um, people who are unsure, people who are, are, are unable to stick to their prevention um, strategies. Um, and so it's a debilitating um, illness. and. What we need to do, if we're going to talk about treating people with um, HIV and AIDS, we can't just talk about health care. We need to talk about health care, physical health care, right. and mental health care. So a large component of that mental health care as well is moving past the stigma or this idea about what it means to be positive in our society. But it seems to be a two-headed monster. There's a generation who came up knowing that there's the specter of AIDS, and there's also on the tail end of that young people who are coming of age sexually who say, oh, well, it's not a big deal anymore, which, to your credit and organizations like you, it is less of a big deal. It's yes. a chronic, manageable condition yes. now. Yes. But still, we see the infection rates not slowing down in particular segments. So yes. how do you come at both of those things simultaneously? Well, you hit the nail on the head. This is a, now a dual problem mm -hmm. of stigma and complacency. So, well, complacency, um, how do we deal with that? Well, yeah. we do what we can to raise awareness around HIV and AIDS. The more people, the, the more people who talk about it, um, the more people will be aware of it. And yeah. we need to do what we can to remember that HIV, um, while it's no longer a death sentence, it's not necessarily easy to live with. Right. And then stigma, we know that HIV and AIDS thrive in the shadows of shame and stigma. And that shame and stigma can prevent somebody from asking questions, mm -hmm. getting tested, getting on medication, and seeking help. Yeah, so like you said, I just thought it's two horrible sides of a coin between complacency and being completely stigmatized. I just want to get a sense of what it's like to do your work then. I know that you recently were palling around with Miss Universe yes, and the yes. idea of a job swap came up. So um, yes. we pretty much have an idea about what her day to day is like, but what's it like to be the CEO at GMHC? Walk us through that. Sure, you know, I have to say the first word that comes to mind is rewarding. Mm -hmm. um, I get to see, I get to be inspired every day by the staff the dedicated staff who do life-saving work every single day, and these are a group of people who I am so proud to be associated with. And we also have the clients who are not afraid to speak their mind, and I would like to think that part of that is because of the culture we created at GMHC, mm -hmm. but also they live the activist lifestyle. Um, they are fighting for their rights and their lives, and I love being a part of it even if they are fighting me to create better <laughs> services for them. But it's okay because right. essentially we're on the same side. Mm -hmm. And so listening to these clients, and I've worked out a deal with the clients at GMHC today, you don't have to scream because I'm listening. Mm -hmm. And so it's a lot of um, working with our clients and working with our staff to determine what are the current needs? How can we do better? Um, we owe it to the HIV community the LGBT community to make GMHC the best organization we possibly can be. And so there are lots of meetings, there's a lot of, I have an MSW and an MBA, and I enjoy using both. Okay. I enjoy trying to figure out what type of services are needed, mm -hmm. but I also enjoy trying to figure out how to be more efficient so we can offer more services to more people. Well, speaking of more services to more people, we have a very real threat in all of these health care schemes that are going on at the government level right now. Talk to me and give a little insight about the Ryan White uh, AIDS care that 
sure. we may be under threat. Yeah. So the Ryan White portfolio is about $2.3 billion large. Um, and it's uh, dedicated solely to services for people living with HIV and AIDS. And it has been um, very helpful, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, it's potentially under threat. I think there are a lot of protections for it. Um, and I think anything that threatens that funding um, can be dangerous to the, obviously, the people it serves. But also, it's also a larger, it would be a bigger threat to public health. So, I mean, we know how HIV works. Right. If a person stays on their medication and becomes virally suppressed, they are less likely, much less likely, almost, and I think the science says negligibly, uh, did I say that word right? Yeah. They, it's negligible that they will pass on the virus. So by cutting funds for people with HIV and undermining their care and not having people become virally suppressed mm -hmm. um, can be a threat to public health. Well, I think that the science is back on that one, and it's absolutely true. So I wondered what you think the broader community should be doing to help push these issues to the fore in the tradition of the founders of the GMHC who were out there advocating and making the most noise, fighting for their lives. Where's the fight now? Yes. Well, we learned many, many years ago that silence equals death. So the fight has to be in our voices, whether that's our vocal voice, um, showing up at rallies, marching, mm -hmm. whether it's on paper, writing, writing, writing white papers, op-eds, um, having meetings with people who can influence these decisions, um, and making sure that the government is held accountable to taking care of the Americans who are most needy of services. So speaking of those services and taking care of the needs of people, how do you work in these diverse communities, whether they're the long-term survivors, people who are newly diagnosed, people who haven't even been tested, and people who are clamoring for services, segmenting that population and breaking that down? Yeah. How do you work? So it's about understanding their particular needs. Mm -hmm. And the best way to do it, I found, is to speak to them gotcha. and to let them tell us. I can come up with great models that I think will work, mm -hmm. and I do have some ideas, but um, they're, they're effective because they come directly from the clients that we serve. We hold focus groups, we, we listen to them um, formally and informally, and so we need to kind of understand the data mm -hmm. and what their needs are, and they usually go hand in hand. Um, usually what they say is a little ahead of the data, yeah. but it tells us maybe what data we need to find. So being fully aware of what you just said about uh, suppressing the virus and how that's the broadest health implications for everyone in the country and the world, I wondered if you could point to something that's the greatest threat to gay men's health specifically, whether it's a government inaction or complacency or something about personal responsibility that we could all be doing. What do you just want to eradicate right now? Yeah, you know, if I had to say, I would have to say stigma. Mm -hmm. I think stigma is so deadly because yeah. it, it's pervasive, it's, it, people can't see it, and it lives in places that you don't even realize, and it prevents people from taking care of themselves talking about it, learning about it, especially the younger generation. Yeah. And in some cultures, it's difficult to talk about. So for this entire series, we've been saying the gay agenda, are we there yet? So I'm going to let you answer that as we finish our conversation. So what does that mean to you? Yeah. Are we there yet? Well, are we there yet? Um, I, think, I think the gay community should never think that we're there yet until we have full rights, full equal rights on all levels, um, and that there are fewer and fewer threats. So are we there yet? I would say no, because we have a lot of work to do. However, we can't give up fighting, and that I know. Silence equals death, and we cannot give up fighting for our rights, and we also need to work with our allies. I want to call out to all the allies, no movement has ever been successful when it was only the people in that movement fighting. We need our allies to support us.